In 1964, Chrysler engineers built an engine so revolutionary it was codenamed Doomsday. Four camshafts, four valves per cylinder. A design so advanced, Ford called it cheating, NASCAR banned it, and Chrysler executives buried it in a vault. But the real story? This engine wasn't just a racing secret, it was a weapon. Tonight we uncover the truth and the conspiracy that killed it. The horsepower wars were raging, muscle car legends were being born, and automakers were locked in a high-stakes battle for speed and dominance. Chrysler had just made a bold statement with a commanding 1-2-3 finish at the Daytona 500, forcing rivals to take notice. Ford, refusing to be outshined, responded with their 90-day wonder. The now iconic 427 SOHC engine, a marvel of rapid engineering and raw performance. But Chrysler wasn't going to sit quietly. Word got around about Ford's new powerhouse, and Chrysler engineer Bill Weertman wasn't impressed. The camera was a band aid, he'd later say. We went nuclear. We wanted dual cams, four valves, something Europe hadn't even tried. Weertman's team, including metallurgist Richard Moser, designed the A925 in secret at Chrysler's Highland Park facility. Their goal? 7,000 RPM, 600 horsepower, a Formula One engine for NASCAR. This idea led to the development of the A925 Hemi prototype, a dual overhead cam version of the legendary Hemi, later nicknamed the DOHC Hemi. What made the A925 Hemi truly special was its clever blend of innovation and practicality. It was designed to work with a stock 426 Hemi block, but with a twist. The block used in the prototype had none of the usual machining for lifters or related valve train components because it didn't need them. With dual overhead camshafts, the valve train was completely reimagined. Each cylinder head was outfitted with two camshafts, one for the intake valves and one for the exhaust, creating space for a four-valve-per-cylinder layout. This wasn't just for show. It used a pentaroof head design, which essentially improved upon the traditional Hemi by increasing airflow and combustion efficiency. The result? A more powerful, more advanced Hemi that pushed the boundaries of what was possible in 1960s engine technology. With the new pentaroof cylinder head design, engineers now had something wild on their hands. 16 intake valves and 16 exhaust valves. That's double the normal count for a V8, and it required a serious rethink of the intake system. So Chrysler built a custom intake setup to NASCAR specifications, designed for a single carburetor feeding 16 individual intake runners. It was a complex piece of hardware, purpose-built to handle the airflow demands of such a radical design. But what's even more unusual was that the intake manifold wasn't made from aluminum, like most race parts of the era. Instead, it was crafted from magnesium, a rare and lightweight choice, even in high-performance circles. The valve covers were also magnesium, giving the engine a futuristic edge in both weight savings and material science. With all the weight savings from the magnesium components and the elimination of traditional valve train parts, the A925 Hemi had the potential to be a high-revving monster. On paper, it was capable of screaming to 7,000 RPM or more, with power estimates well north of 500 horsepower. For the mid-1960s, that kind of performance was almost unheard of from a naturally aspirated engine. To test the limits, engineers hooked the prototype up to a transmission and an electric motor, essentially using the setup to simulate high RPM operation without internal combustion. It was a clever workaround to see how the engine components would handle stress under extreme conditions. And for a brief moment, it worked. Ford caught wind. Their spies leaked photos to NASCAR, screaming, unfair. But Chrysler's real problem? The A925's magnesium parts. Lightweight? Yes. Flammable? Absolutely. We called it the fire breather. One spark, and the intake manifold would torch the shop. Then, disaster. During a 1964 dyno test, the camshaft bosses shattered at 6,500 RPM. Engineer Larry Rathgeb admitted, 
The block couldn't handle the stress. We needed titanium, but that was moon metal back then. NASCAR banned overhead cams, killing Ford's Cammer and Chrysler's A925, but whispers persist. Was it really about fairness? Or did Chrysler's own executives sabotage the project? Chrysler's board prioritized the 426 Hemi and their lucrative military contracts. The A925? Too dangerous, too expensive, too ahead of its time. There was no longer a need for the experimental dual overhead cam Hemi. No racing outlet, no competitive use, and no justification to continue development. The program was officially dead in the water, not because it lacked potential, but because the rule book closed the door on it. While the mechanical failure and NASCAR ban was real, it wasn't the only reason the A925 was buried. At the time, Chrysler was undergoing internal leadership changes and facing tight budget constraints. The company was also trying to recover from financial instability, which made upper management hesitant to fund long-shot projects with uncertain returns. Many within the industry have also speculated that the A925 was shelved not just because it was problematic, but because it posed a political risk. It was potentially too powerful, too radical, and too expensive to justify especially in a climate where the automotive industry was shifting towards safety, emissions control, and corporate restraint. The A925 was hyper-advanced. Lightweight alloys, high-compression dual cams, custom heads, but that came at a cost. Manufacturing it at scale would have required retooling entire factories and training a new generation of mechanics. Worse, the technology was unproven in daily driving. You can imagine the nightmare, warranty issues, overheating, valve failures, all from customers expecting a standard V8. Chrysler might have been bold, but they weren't stupid. They knew releasing this engine in 1964 would be like trying to run a spaceship on dirt roads. The engine could have created tension with regulators, competitors, and even internal divisions within Chrysler itself. In the end, it was easier to kill the project than to fight for its survival. Besides that, Chrysler was also internally channeling its resources into a beast that would become a legend, the 426 Hemi. Unlike the A925, which was bleeding edge and complex, the Hemi was simple, brutal, and already proven in drag racing. The decision makers didn't want two kings competing for the throne. The 426 Hemi had big sponsors, factory backing, and a clear pipeline to NASCAR. The A925? It was risky, expensive, and had no production plan. In the eyes of executives, it was better to bet on the Hemi horse and bury the other. But here's where things get darker. In the 1960s, Chrysler wasn't just making cars. They were heavily involved in military and aerospace contracts. They helped develop the Redstone missile. They worked on the Saturn I rocket, they had government access most car companies could only dream of. That access came with strings attached. Some believe the A925 wasn't just a racing prototype. It was dual-use technology, possibly intended for military-grade land vehicles or experimental platforms. Was it a race engine? A military mule? A prototype for armored recon? Possibly all three. Decades later, Mopar fanatic John Mahoney unearthed the sole surviving A925 in Kansas. It was like finding Excalibur, he said. But Chrysler's lawyers threatened him. Return it or face consequences. They claimed it was government property. I asked, since when do school teachers own missile parts? Only two of these engines were ever made. One of the cylinder heads ended up on eBay decades later. The other complete engine disappeared until John Mahoney stepped in. John was a lifelong Mopar fan who had always chased rare parts and hidden legends. He first heard about the A925 in 1982 at a car event in Detroit. How the engine disappeared from the Chrysler Engineering Building and ended up at the location years later is a bit of a mystery, but John was able to get the owner's name and talk with him. A year later, he tracked the engine down to a man named Herb Wilson, a schoolteacher who raced cars on the weekends. Herb didn't need it anymore, 
So John bought it and brought it back to his Kansas City garage, where it sat for years, mostly out of sight. He would show it to a few close friends, but the wider world had no idea that one of the rarest engines in American history was sitting quietly under his roof. Then in 2018, at another Mopar event, John's friends told him it was time to bring it into the light. With help from a friend named Mike Ford, John dug through his garage, gathered all the parts, and brought the engine to the 2019 Indy show. People were stunned. Seeing the A925 in person was like finding a lost piece of history. But John didn't stop there. He went looking for more. In an old magazine, he found a name, Richard Moser, one of the engineers who helped design the camshaft setup. John reached out, and to his surprise, Richard still had the original design drawings. Then John contacted Bill Weertman, the lead engineer on the project. Bill shared rare photos from 1964, helping piece together the story even more. Compared to other engines of its time, the A925 was in a class of its own. Most American engines back then relied on push rods and made great low-end torque, but not many revved high or used advanced parts. Even Ford's 427 SOHC, as impressive as it was, didn't go as far as Chrysler did with the A925. The lightweight design, dual cams, and four-valve heads weren't just rare. They were unheard of in American V8s. It's the kind of engine you'd expect to find in a Formula One car, not a Detroit muscle machine. John continued to collect missing pieces over the years. Headers, intakes, pulleys, hoping to fully restore the engine. His goal was to display it at major car shows, including the Carlisle Chrysler Nationals and the Muscle Car and Corvette Nationals. For him, the A925 wasn't just metal and bolts. It was a story worth telling. In the end, the A925 never turned a lap in NASCAR, never got bolted into a car, never roared down the drag strip. But it showed the world that Chrysler wasn't afraid to dream big. They didn't just follow trends, they set them. If the rules had stayed the same, if the testing had gone a little better, the A925 might have rewritten the future of American performance. Only one known piece of the A925 survived, a prototype cylinder head that surfaced decades later in a private sale. Aside from that, nearly all documentation of the engine was lost, discarded, or classified internally. The A925 is remembered today not as a triumph, but as one of the most mysterious engines ever conceived by an American automaker. It was built to lead Chrysler into a new era of dominance, but was buried before it ever had the chance. Though it shared displacement with its iconic sibling, the A925 was a technological leap toward modern Formula One-inspired architecture. Its failure, due to cracked tappet bosses and NASCAR's 1964 camshaft ban, meant the 426 Hemi remained Chrysler's face of dominance, while the A925 faded into obscurity as a what-if legend. The A925's magnesium intake manifold and valve covers were so rare that surviving parts are now considered holy grails for Mopar collectors. What if the A925 had raced? Would Petty or Lorenzen have driven it? Would Chrysler have dominated the 70s? Or was it never meant for cars at all? This is Paul at Rare Car Stories. Catch you next time.